How's everyone doing? My name is EJ Ortiz. I'm a certified welder. I want to speak on a couple things that I think will help out welders out there that are either experiencing disillusionment or going through the stresses of what the industry offers. Sometimes when we're in school, we have a romanticized ideation to what the industry will look like. And when we get there, it's a totally diametrically opposed thing. Number one, some schools promote the falsity that when you get in welding, you will make 100K. That's not true. It's rare. It could happen. But it will entail a lot of travel, initial investment of funds to be able to acquire the tools, to be able to travel and experience. Because, trust me, if a company is going to pay you that much money to travel, you got to go in there, pass 6G tests and do a lot of things. But it does, depending on where you live and the skills and the certs that you have, you could make good money. I mean, right now, I'm not bragging. It's just an example, you know, like, you know, I do well in this welding, you know, I make good money, but I also put in the work, you know, 6G aluminum tests, you know, stainless cert, flux core cert, you know, uh, aluminum MIG cert, and all those things make me a little bit worth money. And, you know, allows me to negotiate races when the time comes. All right. So number two. Others in the shop. The dynamic of every shop is different. There'll be some older individuals that you could learn so much from. But sometimes they have an old school mentality where there's a new hot shot coming in. And let's say you are a hot shot. And they feel their jobs are threatened. So they might talk junk. Or sometimes their patience is low. So even though you're getting your feet wet. Maybe it's your first shop or second shop. Maybe you switch different industrial concentrations. Maybe you went from doing manufacturing. Now you're in a coded certified shop. Where every, every little tack. Every little fit up. Every little weld has to be inspected by a CWI. Whether it's x-ray, non-destructive testing, whatever method to employ that it makes sure that your codes meet the WPS, the welding procedure specification, as well as code. Whatever code it may be. D12, ask me, API, D11, whatever it may be. So they make fun of you. They'll try to discourage you. They'll gossip about you. And number three, sometimes the work is stressful. Sometimes you could take your time and make sure that you do it right the first time. But sometimes within that, you, you, you feel a little bit rushed, a little time pressure, because there is a looming deadline. And depending on what the job is, maybe that when that job got bid, it, it's a strict contractual agreement. And if you if you go past that, and whatever grace period may be, may be in the contract. But if you go past that, that that specific deadline, maybe there's fines and there's legal ramifications to the company. But I will say that you have a choice. The money, that, that could come. You always could put yourself in a position, maybe you could travel and get the necessary certs. But even if that's not the case, the unions and, and other shops, the money's out there. But if you work at a shop and you feel you're underpaid, the fact is you're in the shop. You'll get paid eventually, but use that shop to better your skills, learn. Number two, when you're dealing with other people's perceptions, because I deal with that all the time, you know, I'm not putting race into it. I am a Puerto Rican man. You know, I have tattoos. I listen to hip hop. So just based on mere appearances, sometimes people have a myopic view of who, am, who I might be. Not knowing that, man, I studied this industry. I'm educated. I like the science behind welding. 
I like the metallurgy. I like reading all the dry reading. It's not fun, but I like being knowledgeable in this trade because I, I want to know. It's not about laying a bead. I want to know what every setting does on a machine. When I'm TIG welding, I want to know what how it looks. Low frequency, high frequency, balance, what different tungstens, the characteristics of different types of tungstens, whether it's latinated, seriated, torus, acorinated, trimix, et cetera, et cetera. But they don't know this. I, I, I'm, I'm good at math, so, you know, I like using math to figure out different angles and things like that. Early in my career, you know, I fed into the negativity and me being an A-type personality, I would act harshly towards them and confront them. And it always didn't end up being good. Nothing violent, but just didn't end up being good. And it always created a HR issue. So I learned, you know what? If I don't have people's respect, that's okay. Because at the end of the day, what matters is, am I producing? Am I enacting progressive growth and becoming a better welder, a better fabricator? And am I not wasting the company's time and investment of money to pay me? So in time, some people do turn it around because they see the work ethic. They see that, hey, I'm working through it. Oh, today's an overtime day, but it's a shortened day. Oh, we get off at 2.30. Our normal breaks are at 2. Other people, they, they take their breaks and that's fine. Me, I work through it because in my mind, I'm getting paid for the break anyways. I get off at 2.30, I can get a couple things done. Whether it's cleaning up my welds, whether it's finishing a couple welds, whether it's deburring edges, you know, or just start the cleanup process of my area. So when 2.30 comes, hey, I, I got a little bit of productivity in there. I got a little bit of 10, 15 minute productivity in there. I get off at 30 anyways and I got an hour drive back home but don't worry about the perception of others yeah you want people's respect but people won't always like you for whatever reason you know certain respects should be granted you know the the basic level of respect and dignity of us being humans so yeah always stand up for that but they don't respect your work they don't respect it's okay at the end of the day what's important is are you giving it all your effort and are you getting better uh, Jason Becker, you know, I like listening to his podcast. He does have a great saying. And I try to, something like welding mantra, make your your next weld better than your last. So even if you mess up a weld or something happens, yeah, you have, trust me, you have plenty of welds to lay. Plenty. And number three, man, just go out and continue to to learn as much as you can. You know? I mean, it's trial and error. And there's so much to learn from more experienced people and less experienced people because everyone has their own systematic approach and how to fabricate something. Everyone has their own little secrets and tips. I mean, sometimes I'm welding and I'm like, oh, I got to get this vertical joint on this TIG. But I don't really have, even though I got a TIG finger, I got nowhere really to like... Hey, man, oh, there's scrap. Okay, flat bar, another piece of flat bar that goes vertical. Maybe put a piece of angle so, so you know, it's the proper distance. And, I, you know, I could safely put the uh, the, the C-clamp under there and position it. And then I could use that to, like, sort of drag my, my hand comfortably at a good distance. And also allow me the wrist movement in case I had to compensate during the weld. You know, to be able to make sure that there's uniformity all the way around. Uh, but there's always a lot of things to learn in this industry. So don't ever be discouraged. You know, be passionate. You know, the first passion that you got for this trade when you first struck an arc, try to keep that alive. Try to keep that alive. And you'll do just fine in this industry. Money will come. Experience will come. And there's plenty of need for welders. But here's the caveat. Yes, there's a lot of welders that are needed. But here's the caveat that people tend to forget. Two things. Number one, it's a, there is a, a, a skilled gap in terms of welders that are needed. 
And there's a place for people that are inexperienced to get that experience. But the massive gap of older people that people tend to overlook sometimes, they get stuck at, okay, we need we need all these welders. But one thing that gets overlooked is the older gentlemen and ladies that are retiring have experience that is hard earned throughout the years of dedicating themselves to this trade. That's what gets lost. So really, the gaps created is for those that are trained and those that are able to produce quality welds that are up to code. So it's that experience that gets lost and that's where you need to go in and take your own time. So watch on, on watch the Weld app. They got videos. They got YouTube videos. They got they got plenty of articles. Hit up message boards. You know, there's a lot of good message boards out there that are welding specific, and you're able to look at whether it's a hobbyist, whether it's a professional, whether it's someone in school. There's Reddit even. I mean, there's negativity on Reddit, but there's good people that that put in some some good words. So always learn. Learn everything that you can about this trade. You'll never learn everything, but learn as much as you can. It'll make you better, make your job easier. It'll make you worth more money. And lastly, those that do work in a shop where it's just manufacturing, there's no code, there's always a level of quality assurance. Whether they let some things that shouldn't be let go, you know, in terms of welds, you're your own quality assurance. Treat every weld, whether you work at a, at a shop that does code it or things according to code or a shop that doesn't, treat yourself as if you're doing things to code. Train yourself. You know, uh, I worked at a shop where we built agricultural equipment and there were some welders. Sorry, sorry. Okay, so I went to a new company from a shop that built agricultural and this shop was a Canadian based company So I got a Canadian welding certain metal core CWB and You know Some of the guys that came from that company as well They always had struggle uh, Producing welds that are according to code because their mindset was get things done fast it sticks together not take into account the ramifications of cold lab, the ramifications of incomplete fusion, the ramification of overly excessive undercut and thinking that those things were okay. And then they get the inspector and then all of a sudden, hey, they're, they're red flagged, the red flag, red flag, red flagged. And now they're doing things when it's time to weld the things that are super critical, they're, they're, they're stacking pallets and sweeping and just doing small parts. So always have that mentality that you could work fast and efficiently in certain things like grinding and things like that, right? And moving fast, making sure you're walking fast and you look like you have a sense of uh, urgency, expediency in your movements. But when it comes to welding, you're only as fast as your weld allows you to. And it's custom tailored to your welding style. Some people weld hot, some people weld medium. I would say cold, you don't want to weld cold. You know what I mean? For obvious reasons. So I hope that this helps somebody out there. Let me take my glasses off. I hope this helps somebody out there. And just know that this industry is a beautiful industry. And don't be discouraged. Keep pressing forward. God bless everybody.